One of history's stranger meetings occurred in 1921, right around Christmas, a meeting in the White House between two political polar opposites, Republican President Warren G. Harding and Socialist leader Eugene Debs. Warren Harding, a wealthy newspaper publisher and senator, no doubt was in the White House at the behest of many of the nation's largest corporations. Debs, on the other hand, was a socialist candidate, organizing union laborers and agitating business interests, the same interests that supported Harding. The reasons behind the meeting between these two individuals are rooted in the founding of the country and the wishes and predictions of many of the members of the Constitutional Convention. Warren Harding was about to issue a pardon to Debs, and he attached to that pardon a simple condition. He'd like to see Debs before he was released from prison. After all, he told newspaper reporters, and Harding was always one to give a good quote to the newspaper reporters, I've heard so damn much about him. Okay, so the first thing I want to tell you about is the Patreon site at patreon.com. MHC, the UYP. That's the letters of My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, MHC, the UYP. Go there. We got over 120 content items to unlock, including our special episode on LBJ and the Democratic Convention of 1968. Remember to subscribe to the show, particularly on Apple Podcasts. That helps the show grow in its audience. And also, if you like the show, tell someone about it, guys. Thanks. Debs had been convicted of sedition in 1918 for insulting the war effort. This was during World War I. A reporter in Ohio first brought Debs' pardon case to Harding as a senator from that state. But Harding correctly argued that there was nothing a senator could do about pardons. This is one power that the Constitutional Convention gave solely to the executive branch. In the 1920 election, over 900,000 people, nearly a million people, would vote for the federal prisoner, Eugene Debs. Woodrow Wilson's Attorney General, A. Mitchell Palmer, the man behind the Palmer Raids of 1919, no softy on terrorism or anarchism, recommended a pardon to Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson personally hand-wrote, denied, on the pardon application. When Warren Harding became president, he told his Attorney General early on that he planned to pardon Debs but he had to wait till peace was concluded with Germany. His attorney general, Darty, met with Debs and was impressed. When word of the pardon was leaked, however, there was outrage, especially from the American Legion. Many people were puzzled by why Warren Harding would pardon Eugene Debs. The people supporting the pardon application, H.G. Wells, Clarence Darrell, George Bernard Shaw, these were the liberals of the 1920s, not people who would have supported Harding otherwise. Harding, to the extent he justified it at all, said it was part of what he had campaigned on, normalcy, to calm down the country after the agitation of the war and the post-war period. But Harding needed no justification. He needed no vote, and he needed to follow no procedure other than to order it done. In 1921, Warren Harding could pardon any man or woman he wished. Pardons are for the president to make and the president to make alone. No Congress approves it. No Supreme Court reviews it. As Alexander Hamilton labeled it, it is the benign prerogative. And Hamilton argued that such a prerogative should not be subject to the tempers of the day, to the wisdom of crowds, Or as he put it, a single man like the executive would be less subject to calculations that might lead to want of vengeance. It was not a new power. The English king had unlimited pardon power. 
He could pardon those who were convicted. He could reduce sentences. He could turn a death sentence into a life in prison or release. He could even do what the president cannot, pardon ministers who were impeached, although he could not stop an impeachment trial until after it had concluded. Obviously, the power uh, suggested for the new office of president brought critics during the Constitutional Convention and afterwards, because it so resembled the English king. George Mason thought it could be used by a president to protect those who he had instigated to do something wrong. An unrestricted pardon, Mason said, could be exercised to screen from prosecution and punishment those who he, the executive, had secretly instigated to commit the crime and thereby prevent the discovery of his, the president's, own guilt. But defenders, most prominently Hamilton, thought that the pardon was a useful exercise of the commander-in-chief, a well-placed pardon could stop a rebellion in its tracks, for instance, he argued. In history, both of these voices would prove prophetic. The pardon has been used in wars for strategic reasons, just as Hamilton suggested. And it's arguably been used to protect people who at least were accused of doing the bidding of the president in a not-so-good activity. That an executive should be able to pardon individuals is not hotly debated now, nor was it then. This issue that was debated in history would reach a bit of a culmination in 1974, as Richard Nixon's Watergate troubles were increasing, and an incriminatory tape revealed that Nixon knew about the break-in in the Democratic headquarters of the Watergate Hotel, and, more importantly, knew about the cover-up. On the morning of August 8th, Nixon would tap his vice president, Jerry Ford, on the shoulder and say, Jerry, I need to resign, and I think you'll do a fine job. One month later, the now President Ford would pardon his predecessor, Nixon, for any crimes he may have committed. But how we got from the resignation, that event, to the pardon, the other, requires a look at a series of meetings that took place on the days before Nixon's famous resignation and the ride in the helicopter on the South Lawn. Very controversial events. Depending on how you look at them, the pardon power was used either for the wrong type of reasons that George Mason suggested, or for the very right reasons, akin to what Hamilton suggested, or for something in between. On August 1st, Nixon told Al Haig, who was then his chief of staff at the time, to tell Ford to get ready. Don't tell him when, but tell him to get ready. A few hours later, Al Haig met with Ford, and Ford's aide Bob Hartman in the second floor of the EOB, Executive Office Building, next to the White House, where the Vice President's business office is. Things are deteriorating, Haig said. The whole ball game might be over. The tapes are incriminatory for the President. Later, Haig asked for a second meeting, just him and Ford. Are you ready, Ford asked, to assume the presidency if the President must resign? Ford replied, If it happens, Al, I am prepared. Then Haig went through a list of options. Everything from the president being impeached, to the president resigning, the president attempting to pardon himself. An interesting constitutional concept. Then Haig added that some in the White House staff think that if he resigned, you as the new president could pardon him. Haig also made it clear that he, Haig, was not suggesting that. It was other staff members in the White House. Gerald Ford then asked, dangerously in a sense, if Haig thought that he, Ford, would have the power to do such a pardon. The pardon power was discussed, and and later Haig would admit that he had hoped for a pardon, but if Ford divined any thoughts, it's not because I told him. Ford left, saying he would discuss the issue of a pardon with his wife. At this time, we should pause for some interpretation of this meeting. 
This meeting occurred between Chief of Staff Al Haig, the Defender Protector, Eyes and Ears, and Chaperone of the President, and the Vice President of the United States. And it was troubling to some extent. While Haig didn't ask for a pardon outright, the issue was put on the table. In a Washington political speak, that's as close to a quid pro quo. Haig very well could have been sounding Jerry Ford out and certainly reported the meeting to his boss, who was still Richard Nixon. From a standpoint of personality, the hard-driving Haig versus the affable Ford, the man who gives versus the man who takes, the discussion is not surprising. When Ford aide Bob Hartman found out about the second meeting that he was not part of, he was angry with his boss. He told him he should never have discussed the pardon with Haig, It was like a quid pro quo. They got a congressional aide, a person who had served for both Nixon and Eisenhower, who was friendly with Ford, to try to get an objective opinion of what was going on. He reported back that there was no doubt in the world of Washington that Haig was feeling Ford out and that uh, Haig had a reasonable chance to expect a pardon based on their discussions. It was at this point that Ford with Hartman and other aides in the room, called up Al Haig and said, I want to make it clear that nothing in our discussion should imply any advice to the President of the United States, as being Nixon at the time, as to what action he should take, whether he should resign or not. He also said, I want you to understand that I have no intention of recommending to the President what to do. Haig's response was, yes, I agree. The conversation had been confirmed. It is a conversation and a group of meetings that congressional committees and historians would look at very much in years to come. Nixon resigned. Ford became president, had a short honeymoon uh, with the media, with the American people who were delighted that dignity had been restored to the presidency. He said, our long national nightmare is over, calming words to the nation. Congressional critics were impressed with Ford. They liked what was going on. But in the first month of his new presidency, Gerald Ford faced numerous questions about what would happen to Nixon at almost every press conference. At the same time, he was receiving word that Nixon was in ill health, mentally and perhaps physically. Apparently, one aide even said Nixon may not make it to the election. And when Ford asked if he meant 1976, said no the midterms of 1974. Al Haig was still in the White House um, and was one of uh, several former Nixon aides still in the White House pushing for a pardon. And Ford aides had gone to Nixon to try to solicit some type of contrition from him and to perhaps get closure on what Nixon would do with his presidential papers, which at this time, as a matter of law in 1974, was still the property of the ex-president. Ford wanted those papers released to the public. The Nixon aides told the Ford aides that they would accept no conditions at all if there was any to be any kind of pardon. In early September, Ford told his aides, some of which were disappointed, that he planned to pardon Nixon. And on September 9th, the press was told that Ford would make a major announcement, which he did. Nixon would be pardoned for all crimes he had or may have committed. After Ford spoke, no prosecutor would be interested in pursuing Nixon further. The top federal officer, the chief of the executive branch, and the only one in 1974 with the constitutional power to absolve Nixon had acted. The nation, Ford said, wanted to put Watergate behind it. And that was true. Many wanted to resolve the leadership crisis in the White House. Was their president, as Nixon had used in his own words, a crook? I repeat, and I repeat with emphasis, The purpose of the pardon was to try and get the United States, the Congress, the President, and the American people focusing on the serious problems we have both at home and abroad. And I was absolutely convinced then, as I am now, that if we had had this series, an indictment, a trial, a conviction, and anything else that transpired after that, that the attention of the President, the Congress, and the American people would have been diverted from the problems that we have to solve. And that was the principal reason for my granting of the pardon. That had been resolved, but there were still questions about what was the scope of Nixon's involvement in some of the crimes and the cover-up. 
by using his pardon power, Ford had forced the Watergate issue off the table in an awkward way that would, of course, have political repercussions for him and the Republican Party. But he had limited the extent that there would be a further examination of what exactly Richard Nixon had done. Why did Ford have this power? We know a president could commute sentences, perhaps turn a death sentence into a life sentence, forgive a man who is convicted of a crime, perhaps. Lincoln had pardoned many deserters. But to pardon a man prior to conviction, before the evidence had been put out, before a prosecutor, a jury, or a judge had acted, it seems so strong, so king-like. But Ford's power to do this is rooted in the Constitution and one of the events that led to the need for a Constitution, the Shays' Rebellion in Massachusetts. And the realization by Alexander Hamilton and supporters of a strong chief executive that a few well-placed pardons in a time of civil unrest or rebellion might help to cool tensions where there was rebellion and help to induce good behavior. A trial would take far too long for this purpose. And after Hamilton made this argument, this theoretical proposition, a few years later, Washington would do just what Hamilton had outlined when he pardoned the Whiskey Rebels of Pennsylvania, and that helped to cool tensions there. That the constitutional authors thought this power, this pardon power, was related to the president's military power is evidenced by the fact that the power is granted in Article 3 in the same section that gives the president commander-in-chief powers. And he shall have the power to grant reprieves and pardon. James Madison used the pardon power to pardon the pirate Jean Lafitte for fighting with the United States to protect New Orleans during the War of 1812. Lincoln, as we outlined, used the pardon to prevent many deserters from being shot. He thought the war was horrible enough. And to try to convince Southerners to take an oath to the Union, that if they took such a pledge, he could use his pardon power. Uh, Andrew Johnson, in the largest pardon ever, pardoned the entire Confederacy. Any man who had taken arms against the nation would be pardoned, with one exception. Those who were worth more than $200,000, a lot of money at that time. These were the plantation owners, the slave power who Andrew Johnson, of course a poor tailor in Tennessee, blamed for everything. But even many of these men, these wealthy Southerners, after personal visits to President Andrew Johnson, he ended up pardoning them, much to the chagrin of the radical Republican Congress. It was for this act, more than his actual offense, that Andrew Johnson was impeached. In these historical acts, we see the president using the pardon as he would use the army for strategic benefit, to encourage cooperation. It's the president's carrot where the army is his stick. President Ford would not assert that he pardoned his predecessor as an act of war, but he would invoke such thoughts. After all, the country needed to focus. The Soviet Union was still a threat at this time as was inflation. If Richard Nixon was the news topic, how could he, as the chief executive, continue to solve the nation's problems? Of course, he need not have stated his reasons. Pardon is an undiluted power in the Constitution. Just as Warren Harding suffered criticism from the American Legion and Johnson from the Radical Republican Congress, Ford lost his honeymoon with the Democratic Congress and the media and some of the American people. Mr. Ford, you stated that uh, the theory on which you pardoned uh, Richard Nixon was that he had suffered enough. And I am interested in that theory because the logical consequence of that is that somebody who resigns in the face of virtually certain impeachment or somebody who is impeached should not be punished because the impeachment or the resignation in face of impeachment is punishment enough. And I wondered whether anybody had brought to your attention the fact that the Constitution specifically states that even though somebody is impeached, that person shall nonetheless be liable to punishment according to law. Uh, Mrs. Holtzman, I was fully cognizant of uh, the fact that the President, uh, on resignation, uh, was accountable uh, for any criminal charges. Uh, But I would like to say that the reason I 
gave the pardon was not as to Mr. Nixon himself. I repeat, and I repeat with emphasis, the purpose of the pardon was to try and get the United States, the Congress, the President, and the American people focusing on the serious problems we have both at home and abroad. And as he pardoned Nixon, it was clear in political analysis hindsight that he, at that moment, lost his 1976 bid for re-election. Jimmy Carter used the Nixon pardon to justify the pardon of Vietnam War draft dodgers. If the highest man in the land could get a pardon, Carter argued, so should average people. Reagan then used Jimmy Carter's pardon of the Vietnam draft dodgers to justify the pardon of FBI agents who were convicted of ordering illegal wiretaps against the Weatherman American terrorist group. This included Mark Felt. Reagan had no idea at the time that he was pardoning Deep Throat. But Reagan argued, if draft dodgers got pardoned, so should law enforcement agents. Ford's pardon of Nixon, in a sense, became the gift they kept on giving became a precedent for other presidents to use to defend their pardons. There's an increase in interest in pardons after uh, George Bush Sr.'s term when he pardoned Bud McFarlane, Casper Weinberger, and then in the Clinton term when he pardoned Mark Rich, a wealthy man who had evaded uh, taxes in the United States, uh, whose ex-wife, Denise Rich, had contributed to the Clinton campaign. Of course, pardons became a big issue in the middle of George W. Bush's term when he commuted the sentence of Scooter Libby, chief of staff for Vice President Cheney, and the outing of CIA agent Valerie Plain. Bush's acting highlighted the fact that presidents do not need to wait for the end of the term to use the pardon power, though it's very common for them to do so to avoid political pressure. Edward Randolph, uh, at the Constitutional Convention, made the motion to begin the process of starting a constitution. He was the first one to suggest that uh, we needed to move beyond the Articles of Confederation and create a stronger document. But he's horrified the introduction of a presidency into the system. And in fact, he refused to sign the constitution. He warned about this president who seemed so much like a king, and he warned that the executive may end up pardoning his own instruments. And the Libby pardon seems to echo that statement. Bush issued uh, pardons, not uh, surprisingly, for uh, violations of gun laws, and also for a person who poisoned a bald eagle. Clinton used the pardon to reduce the sentence of those who have been convicted of certain drug crimes. Both presidents issued far less than uh, other presidents. There's been a decline in the number of pardons and commutations as we moved into the law and order of the late 20th century. Franklin Roosevelt, with his four terms, issued 3,687. Woodrow Wilson, with two terms, 2,480. They are number one and number two in terms of pardons. Since Carter, everyone's been below 500, from 200 a year to 200 a term, it seems. Clinton was a little over 450. Whomever George W. Bush will pardon, and he's already pardoned one controversial figure, there will be hackles. One thing is clear. Hamilton was right that the benign prerogative could only be used responsibly by one person. It's fairly clear to me that no group of people, such as the Senate or the Congress, would be able to make some of the choices that might need to be made. Legislative bodies are not the best form for showing mercy. Yet there are problems with giving this to the executive as well. Individual decisions are subject to question. Presidents have, as Randolph said, in the past pardoned their own instruments. All are not equal before this benign prerogative, and rich people, contributors, bankers, and governors are more likely simply to get presidential attention than the average Joe. I think the Nixon pardon will remain the most controversial in history. Jerry Ford passed away a couple of years ago, that he never doubted his decision. And I don't think Jerry Ford made his decision in order to increase executive power. I think he did it to spare Nixon and his family some agony, to clear the issue, and perhaps to prevent Nixon's depression and decline. No Senate or Congress in 1974, no body of people would have made the decision that Ford made. 
No poll would have indicated support for it. It's unclear if Special Prosecutor Leon Jaworski would have pressed charges against ex-President Nixon once he resigned. But investigators were looking in other areas, perhaps at other burglaries of Democratic offices, and the public outcry was strong. Some, like Nelson Rockefeller, said that Nixon had already been hung. Should he be drawn out and quartered too? But only one man, who was tight with his family and still relied on Nixon appointees in his White House, could make that call. Yet, for whatever personal reasons Ford may have done it, for whatever noble reasons to protect Nixon's family, perhaps the dignity of the presidency, to be able to focus the nation on dealing with the economy and the Soviet Union, the pardon has had one negative effect. It's pretty clear, especially now with the eight years of the George W. Bush White House, that Ford's pardon emboldened Nixon's apologists, who would gloss over the details of the president's actions cover up the bugging of the opposition party's headquarters. The pardon stopped investigations of the full extent of what the president knew about his operatives' actions. And it possibly has emboldened future presidents. The fetus of monarchy, George Mason warned, when he saw the series of powers given to the president, pardon included. The fetus of monarchy. As we await hearing in the last few days of his term, those that look at history may wonder whether George Mason will be proved again prescient, or whether Alexander Hamilton will.